let me take you deeper. Professional development. Laser-like focus on professional development. Professional development in most communities is like having a spasm. We have a spasm every two to three months and one spasm has nothing to do with the next. And the bottom third say to the middle third, this too shall pass. Focus sustained professional development on a few things. Just as you have in your state plan, just as you're talking about with PGES, formative assessments really work. They really help you when you get to the summative assessments. What doesn't work? What do I suggest? You have the courage to abandon. And by the way, it takes more courage to abandon something that exists than it does to add something new. I suggest you stop spending so much time on class size. I'm sorry. I'm going to suggest you increase class size. Why? Because you will generate substantially more money to spend in areas that do have a big impact. If I have 25 to 1 in a class and I change class size by one student, does it have any impact on student performance? Unless I can pick the one kid. <laughs> if I change class size by two students, can I measure any difference? No. Three. No. The earliest you even can begin to notice a difference is four students. And you can notice it at five. But do you know if you change class size by three students, what it does to your school budget that you could use on some of the other areas? You know what else doesn't work? Sorry. Summer school. It doesn't work. Over 800 research reports. It doesn't work. We just keep doing it. What's the definition of insanity? Now, summer school works if you teach in fundamentally different ways. But if you're basically doing in the summer what they failed in the school year, it doesn't work. The Hattie research, that's why you're going to get the entire report from me if you want it. 132 different indicators they looked at. They'll show you what worked and what didn't. The further you go to the right-hand side, the more powerful it was. On the left-hand side, it didn't work. These are the three things that come up as most important. These are the three things I ask you to think about building your plans around. A culture of high expectations. Relevance of instruction and strong relationships between students and teachers. There is no formula. Every school district in America is different. But as we look at the most rapidly improving schools and we look at what they have done and I look at your PGES plans, the format they lay out in PGES is very consistent with what we found these schools doing. They begin with a goal. And their goal is not the first five. The goal is the last one. That's why the Common Core say college and career ready. You've got to create a culture that will embrace that. So we're going to spend some time on how do you create the culture. I'm going to give you some information. Remember again, I'm going to give you my PowerPoint later. After I go through this information, we're then going to stop and ask you at your tables to discuss it. We're, I'm going to ask you to be at, discussing two things. Of the information he shared, what of that information do we sh need to share and with whom? And how do we do it? Culture trumps strategy. That's what we found in the nation's highest performing schools. Culture, culture trumps strategy. Do you have your rank and file staff believing do you have your community believing that Common Core, Next Generation Assessment, Teacher Evaluation, all the initiatives around PGES, do you have them believing it is an answer to their problem? Or do they see it as one more problem you're bringing to them? High performing schools begin with culture because if not, any of the things you're going to propose this coming school year, you're going to be like the cat in this picture. And those German shepherds are your staff. 
In fact, how many of you could put a human face right on that dog right there? So why do we need to change? That's the reason. Everybody got it? That's the reason. And if I were you, I'd say, what the heck is he talking about? A few months ago, I had the opportunity to participate in a national meeting where they brought six of the nation's most conservative governors together, together with the six most liberal governors. Now there is an unholy alliance. The people from the two ends of the political spectrum. Those governors brought their senior executive staffs with them. They brought the leadership from their state legislatures with them. And they brought corporate leaders with them. I was privileged to be part of that and asked to speak. I was honored. But I was totally confused because of one of the other speakers. It was Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Now, Dr. Rice is a brilliant woman. I had great respect for her. But I said, why would she be here to talk about schools and school reform? Until she began. And that was our opening slide. Ladies and gentlemen, 70% of young people in America are no longer eligible for the military. That was our opening statement. 70% of young people in America no longer eligible for the military. And you know what? I didn't believe her. But she soon convinced me, and I think I'm going to be able to convince you. You know why they're not ready for the military? Because today, 2013, you have to be a high school graduate to go to the military. No longer accept the GED. Um, in addition, and what you find is 30% of the young people in this country aren't graduating from high school. But after you're a high school graduate and you want to go to the military, you now have to take an admission test. You never had to in the past. The test has been around for a long time, but it never used to be an admission test. It used to be a placement test. It's called ASFAB and they're recalibrating ASFAB every six months. You know why they're recalibrating it, redoing it? Because the technology that underpins the military is so critical to job performance and changing so constantly that you've got to be a lifelong learner in the military today, which means you've got to have strong literacy and numeracy skills. And so they create a new test every six months, and it gets harder every six months. Ladies and gentlemen, 30% of the young people in this country last year who had high school diplomas and took the ASVAB exam failed it. I'm sorry, 28% failed it. 30% did not graduate. 28% had high school diplomas but failed the ASVAB exam. How did they get to 70%? Health-related issues, leading the list, obesity. Drug-related issues, legal-related issues all the way up to incarceration. 70% of the young people. And ladies and gentlemen, that percentage is increasing at 1% a year. In the year 2000, it was 58% of our young people. Today, it is 70. The military predicts, predicts within 10 years, it will be 80% of our young people. And you know what? It used to be the fallback position. It used to be the place you would go if you couldn't make it somewhere else. Condi's done with her presentation. We go off to a discussion. And a group of CEOs, big time CEOs, from the biggest corporations in this country are there. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how else to tell you except to tell you they were livid. They were so angry. You know what they said? If they can't make it in the military, what remotely makes you think they can make it in 2013 in the workplace? Yes, they can go to work at a convenient market, but they cannot earn enough money to be self-sustaining. 
The corporate leaders come back to the entire group and say, we would like to speak to the entire group. And they tell their story to the entire group, the senior elected officials of the country. And when they're done, you know what they conclude? If they are not eligible to be employable and be self-sustaining, they are absolutely headed to public assistance. We have 70% of our young people, headed to 80, headed to public assistance. It is unsustainable as a nation. And see, that's what the highest performing schools in America understood. They didn't start with a new set of standards and a teacher evaluation. They said, we have a problem. Our standards are too low. Not that we're not working hard, not that we don't care, but the world has changed. And so that causes me to ask you a tough question, and I'm going to challenge your assumptions. That's what they did in the highest performing schools in the country. They challenged people's assumptions before they went out and recommended changes. And let me challenge the assumption. Let's begin with college ready. Are they ready? Have you looked at the ACT study that just came out? Remember, I'm going to give you my PowerPoint, the notes. This spring, college freshmen are well or very well prepared. 89% of high school teachers in this country said yes. 26% of freshman college instructors said yes. Let me take you deeper. 51.7% of two-year college graduates in this country take one or more remediated courses. 19.9% .9 of four-year college students take one or more remediated courses. Now, I recently addressed a group of university presidents. They were all happy up to this point until I said my next thing. I can solve that problem for the universities. I can solve that problem for the two-year colleges. I know how to solve it. And they said, great, tell us. I said, fine, stop omitting them. Oh, we can't do that. Why not? We get seats to fill. Folks, we have more freshman college seats in America than we have freshmen to fill them. If you ever hear of supply and demand, I can drop out of high school in the state of Kentucky and have my choice of colleges and nobody's talking about it. And we're using the word college ready as if it really means something. Now, I can't get into the most premier universities, but I can get into a college. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the retention rate in this country over the last 13 years, or last year rather, between the first and second year. That is the retention rate between the first and second year in college in this country. How many co uh, high schools in this room are with Lee reporting out how many kids go to college but never report out how many of those kids ever complete? Or how many even report out how many are still in college one year later? They did in the nation's most rapidly improving schools. They track their graduates with hard data and they report it out. And you know what it does? It validates why all of you raised your hand 40 minutes ago. And I asked, how many know recent four-year college graduates back at home? In depth. The bubble is about to burst on higher education in America, I predict. Why? Because all the data I'm giving you, I got from the Governor's Association who have begun to say, we have a problem. Let me keep going. If that is the retention rate, let me suggest you the reverse of that number is the dropout rate. 
just the dropout rate in the first year of two-year colleges and four-year colleges in this country, and nobody's talking about, folks, if in K-12 we had those numbers, we'd be on the front page of every newspaper. Accountability is light is begun to be shined on secondary, uh, post-secondary education in America. To the point where you'll see in a little while, the framers of the Common Core State Standards did not want to put the word college in it. It was under a lot of pressure we finally went to college and career ready. The initial term was Common Core State Standards career ready. Career ready. You see the impact. This is the average four-year uh, graduation rate between uh, 1983 and 2012 in our two-year and four-year colleges in America. And nobody's talking about it. So are they career ready? Let's see. We presently have an unemployment rate of 13 million uh, people. That does not include, that's the number of unemployment as of last month. That does not include all the people whose unemployment benefits have expired. But at the exact same time, we have 3.8 million well-paying jobs unfilled. And these are not entry-level jobs. These are well-paying jobs. These are jobs that pay in excess of $50,000 a year for the U.S. Department of Labor. 3.8 million. And our college graduates are coming home, can't find jobs. 13 million people unemployed. What's wrong with the picture? <laughs> What's wrong with the picture is America changed. And college isn't an end in and of itself, much less what we're doing in K-12 of reporting college a mission as the end line. Isn't that what you report out? Which you major in matters a lot. 53.6% of baccalaureate degree recipients under the age 25 or under are now unemployed or underemployed. That's all those you just raised your hands about. And 3.8 million jobs unfilled. This is U.S. majors last year, this past school year. Rank order, top 10. In rank order. Um, American universities. Number one major business. Number two general studies. I got a question. What is that? And the answer is, no major. And when you and I went to school, it wasn't an option. It means come, take as many courses as you can, stay as long as you will, please. Number three, social science and history. Four, psychology. You can read the numbers. Now, right behind it, I'm going to give you the rank order of college majors in the seven most industrialized nations that follow America this past school year. Are you telling the kids what you major in matters? Are you telling the kids it doesn't matter what you took? It's what you ultimately can do with what you took. Why does it say college and career ready? Your first year salaries last year. Psychology, communication, social science, interdisciplinary. Folks, what we find is an inverse relationship between where the majors are, where there are jobs, and what those jobs pay. Let me give you a very controversial but present day example. There is a person in and I don't know where you'll come individually. It doesn't matter at all to me where you come on this one. Did anybody hear about a young man who leaked 
some information. Anybody know, know his last name? What is it? Good and loud. Right. Does anybody know how old he was? He's 29. He's a high school dropout. Did you hear that? Anybody know what his salary was? $122,000 a year. You know why? It doesn't matter what you took. It's whether you got any skills or not. He's the poster child of this issue. That skills matter. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. 48% of employed four-year college graduates, and these are the ones who are employed. Does not, remember, 56% don't have jobs. But of those employed, 48% are in degrees that did not require, are in jobs that did not require a high school degree. Are you telling the kids what you major in matters? Ponder this one. That one doesn't grab you? Ponder this one. These are all Bureau of Labor Statistics, all being released this summer in a national report. And you know when it becomes real personal? When it's your kid. When it's your son or daughter or grandchild or niece or nephew. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to begin to talk about this in your communities so that they understand why the new standards are what they are, which I'll show you in a few minutes, and why those standards are so fundamentally different than the old standards and the new tests are so fundamentally different, and how we got to have higher expectations but relevant expectations for every child. See, once you understand the problem, then you begin to say, whoa, I get it. Let me take you deeper. These are jobs in America from 1980, 2010, headed to 2040. U.S. Census Bureau. What's happened is the jobs in the middle are disappearing. Technology. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, technology began to replace entry-level workers. Technology has now replaced medium-wage workers. And our four-year college graduates, some of our best and brightest kids coming out of our schools are prepared for those middle set of jobs. And they don't have the skills to move up, so they end up moving down. That's what this is about. It's not about the mechanics simply of a new set of standards and an evaluation system. They are the results, not the purpose of the new standards. And then you trump it all with cost. The increase in cost of higher education in the last 17 years has been twice the rate of inflation. The average college student is leaving with $26,600 in debt and over half of them unable to find work. This chart's a little hard to read. Let me try to describe it to you. The first line, the red line. 1978 on this side, 2012 over here. Bottom line is the increase in the cost of food. The increase in the cost of food has been 200%. The consumer price index has gone up during that same period of time, 210%. The cost of shelter has gone up slightly under 400%. The cost of medical care, slightly under 600%. The cost of higher education, tuition and fees, up nearly 1,200%. To the point, this is the unemployment rate of high school dropouts in America from 07 to last year, high school dropouts. This is the unemployment rate of four-year college graduates, 25 and under.
ladies and gentlemen, why do the Common Core State Standards say college and career ready? Why do we have this growing call for career ready? Until you understand it, it will be very hard to get people to say at the classroom level that they need to do something different. Just because there's an edict of new Common Core and new assessments and teacher evaluation doesn't mean they're going to embrace it unless they see it as a solution. I'm afraid you're going to bring it to them as a problem of a new thing they got to do. High performing schools, I say for about the sixth time, created the culture before they tried to implement any change. And it's only going to get worse. Give you just a snapshot on this. Those who've heard me speak before know I like to spend an entire day showing you how technology is not done changing. Technology is going to accelerate and change over the next decade and show you what those are. We don't have time today. I love